Hello everyone, Juxtaposition here. Today's video will focus on the mysterious uh, death of William Holden, a major blockbuster film star in the 1950s and 1960s of Hollywood. He was found early Monday morning, um, November 17th, 1981, in his luxury apartment in the towers of uh, Santa Monica, looking out at the ocean and uh, across the road from the beach, I guess that's Pacific Coast Highway 1 and Ocean Avenue. And um, I'm not sure what floor William Holden was in, but he had a magnificent view of the Pacific Ocean. And he was found wearing his pajama tops only, his pajama top, so no bottoms. He was found on the floor with blood everywhere, with a deep gash in his forehead. And it appeared that he'd been dead for several days. That's a theme that, um, one of the themes, I mean, in Hollywood deaths. One is we have professional killings like the Sharon Tate and Abigail Folger and Lena LaBianca. Those are professional. You know they're professional because no murder weapon is found and there's no substantial clues as to who the killers were at the scene of the crime. And things like um, bullet cartridges are picked up. You know that the scene is scrubbed scrubbed. It's very professional, like the Dr. Victor Ota massacre of his wife and two sons and his secretary receptionist. Complete professional. Not only was that a professional killing where they killed the kitty cat and five humans, then they type up a manifesto note on, on Dr. Victor Ota's typewriter, then stage a staged felony arson blaze of his Frank Lloyd Wright house and burn it to the foundation. And no one is caught and there's no clues whatsoever. They do round up the usual suspect in a creek bed about a mile away and they blend it on him. But there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever to uh, connect the person who was convicted of that murder, you know, five humans plus a kitty cat so that's six and commit a felony arson and reposition a red rolls royce i mean it seems like you'd need a team of people to do that elaborate of a mass murder at 999 north rodeo gulch road but hey that's just me i'm skeptical anyway we have some of this with the Natalie Wood disappearance because she her body turns up drowned 12 days after William Holden does. So, I mean, Holden Holden's not drowned, but he's got a deep gash in his forehead and he's on the floor bottomless with blood everywhere. And um, looks like somebody might have clobbered him in the head, right? His um, apartment is meticulous, well-kept, it doesn't appear any burglary has occurred. The door was locked. Um, so it's a mystery, right? You know, so there was a teak table that had been shoved into the wall. That was the only thing that was out of place in this meticulous apartment, which you should know was uh, decorated in the style of one of, uh, of William... Holden's favorite film that he did in 1955 entitled Love is a Many Splendored Thing and the motif and decor of William Holden's apartment high rise apartment was in the style of Hong Kong and um, the romantic film where he plays a married man who separated he was a reporter from America who travels to Hong Kong to report on the Chinese Civil War, so-called, and meets 
a Eurasian woman who's a medical physician and um, she has an adopted daughter. They fall in love in a romantic way. Then um, he goes off to Korea to cover the Korean War. The film is set 1949-1950 is the, the set design and the film chronology. And um, I'll come back to this in a second, but it's very romantic and it's a film that you know I would recommend that you watch Love is a Many Splendored Thing, which is a definite Grand Slam home run for William Holden in a lead, leading role, 1955. The woman um, is Jennifer Jones. She plays the Eurasian physician doctor. This was back when people respected doctors, you know, and Hollywood celebrated doctors as people that you could trust and that they cared about people, not like COVID doctors, which are focused on zipping it, not talking, and making sure that they push the right code and buttons on their reimbursement page for their insurance and Medicare so they get maximum payment for doing whatever whatever it is that they do because uh, doctors have now disgraced themselves as a, just like attorneys, right? Do you trust attorneys? Do you trust medical doctors? <laughs> I don't. I would quadruple check anything, any suggestion they say. I would also ask the doctor, what do you get paid if you do this? And what do you get paid if you do chelation therapy? And what, because the answer is, you know, they don't get paid at all to do alternative treatments. So are, is there more than one way to solve a problem? Yes, there is. Are, there, are a doctor or a lawyer going to recommend that? No, they're going to recommend what pays them the most, the quickest, and gets you out of their office. Because they know that it probably isn't going to end well for you, right? If you have a defense lawyer, I mean, they lose 100% of their cases result in a felony plea agreement. So they know going in that you're not going to be happy with their performance. So they just want to get the money and put it in their bank account, you know, like Alan Klein did with the Rolling Stones, and then tell you what you want to hear, tell your spouse what they want to hear. Don't worry, honey, we're going to get all the charges dropped and get you out of their office until they ask for another retainer from you or another procedure for Medicare for you. That's how those businesses work. They're all paint by numbers. It's the system. It's not the person. It's all set up. It doesn't matter if you're smart or stupid. It doesn't matter if you're, you care or you don't care. You're apathetic. It doesn't make any difference. If you want to have a career as a doctor, you got to push the coding button that will give you the money that you need to buy groceries. It's really simple. It's financial, weaponized engineering. Financial weaponry. All right, so in the case of William Holden, um, not his real name. His real name is William Franklin Beadle Jr. Uh, he was born in Illinois, and his father was an industrial chemist. And then they moved, the family moved from Illinois near St. Louis, which is Missouri. They lived about, uh, I don't know, 17 miles from St. Louis, but in Illinois. And they moved to Pasadena, okay? And... Um, so that's sort of on the fringe of Hollywood way. You know, it's close to Burbank. It's close to um, Disney Studios. It's, it's uh, well, eventually, you know, when he moved there, Disney Studios had not been opened in 1921. That is when William Holden arrived. He was born April 17th, 1918. And three years later in 1921, his family moved him to Pasadena. All right, so let me read you a little bit here uh, regarding William Cole, William Holden. There's so many Williams, you know. I get confused sometimes when I talk about Williams. Okay, so let me read this. William Holden, whose handsome face and easy masculine manner made him the quintessential American in many movies. He was found dead Monday morning in his apartment in Santa Monica. He was 63 years old. Again, 
Only have pajama tops. He's on the floor. Blood everywhere. Deep gash in his forehead. William Holden apparently died of natural causes, according to the coroner's office, which will perform an autopsy today. That's implied linguistics. I'm reading from the Los Angeles Times. You see what they just did? They just told you the coroner's office said he died of natural causes. Then they, in the same sentence, say that they, uh, they haven't done the autopsy yet. That's kind of sneaky, right? They're giving you the medical examination County of Los Angeles conclusion when they admit that there's been no medical examination performed. That's the Los Angeles Times. How professional is that? I think the Los Angeles Times uh, fits into the category of Vanity Fair, Vogue magazine, New York Post, which is, puts them in a propaganda poppycock purveyor category in my book. Wouldn't believe anything I read in the Los Angeles Times I would, unless I can double and triple, quadruple check it. If I can double, quadruple check it, then maybe, yeah, I will believe it. But you see right there, they're discrediting themselves by telling me that William Holden's death was natural. When was the last time that you had a divot in your forehead naturally? Must, they treat people like they're stupid because I guess people are stupid. I mean, I think people are stupid. If you'd believe that sentence, that's a contradictory sentence. It's like Megan Kelly going on television this weekend and saying that she had a death in the family. Her, her sister, age 58, died and that she hadn't been doing well the last couple of years, but it was unexpected. Well, how can you have a sister that's whose health has been suffering for the last couple of years, but it was an unexpected death. No, that would be an expected death. So perhaps her health was perfectly fine and something happened the last year or two, you know, like maybe she got inoculated and then she had a nervous reaction and died, right? But you can't say that on television. So you got to make up linguistics that can be broadcast on the radio signals. According to friends, William Holden was preparing to act in that championship season, a movie version of a Hollywood play. Anyway, Santa Monica police said that William Holden was discovered on the floor of his bedroom by his apartment manager and that he may have been dead for several days. I think you could base that on, you know, what he smelled like, the odor in the room, and or decomposed uh, rigor mortis. <clears throat> you should know that uh, William Holden was the best man for Ronald Reagan and, um, William Holden's wife at the time, which um, I'll give you the date. It's very important. March 4th, 1952, William Holden was the best man and his wife, um, whose real name is Artis Ackerson. Artis Ackerson, who goes by the stage name Brenda Marshall, who is three years older than William Holden. They were married in in uh, 1941 and they had a 30 their marriage lasted 30 years they were separated though for a number of years of course but they were married in 1941 and then in on uh, March 4th 1952 Ronald Reagan his second marriage remember his first marriage was in 1940 um, to Jane Wyman who was Dominican order Catholic Roman Catholic, uh, and played a role in the Dominican order. And Jane Wyman was married to Ronald Reagan for nine years, 1940 to 1949. So they went through World War II together. And then Nancy Davis, not her real name. <clears throat> um, Nancy Davis's real name is Anne Frances Robbins. She marries Ronald Reagan, who that is Ronald Reagan's real name is Rob R Ronald Wilson Reagan, who I personally have met him. I believe I met him in 1981 um, at the Travel Lodge Hotel in Los Angeles at LAX. And he had five bodyguards who were totally cool. They didn't, they didn't seem afraid of me at all, and they didn't interfere with me at all. And we shook hands and spent five minutes talking before, of course, big crowd shows up on the perimeter. And that, that was the end of the conversation. You just can't have a conversation with a celebrity anymore when it 
creates a, you know, clogs the lobby of the hotel. All right, so um, William Holden's wife, who again, her name is Ardis Ackerson, she's the matron of honor for Nancy Davis, who of course, his real name is Anne Francis Robbins, going by Nancy Davis. So it's a family affair. This Ronald Reagan second um, wedding was impromptu. Um, Nancy Davis and Ronald Reagan been dating for three years, and they went to dinner at Chasen's, which is over in Beverly Hills, walking distance from the Sharon Tate murder scene, down the hill at Chasen's. It's right around the corner from that creepy lawyer, Paul Caruso. He's walking distance to Chasen's. It's also walking distance to Cartier Jewelry and Rodeo Drive is near Chasen's. It's a very famous restaurant. Ronald Reagan and Nancy Davis had their own special booth that they sat and had dinner for the many times that they dined at Chasen's. It was decided after three years that they would get married, so they scheduled an impromptu wedding at the, um, the Little Brown Church. Now that's important. The Little Brown Church is in Studio City, you know, where William Holden's third wife, you know, drowned in the swimming pool. Kind of not different than Natalie Wood, not her real name, Natasha Zakarenko. She was thrown into the water at three o'clock in the morning, like a sack of potatoes and drowned. 12 days after William Holden's body was discovered, you know, on Monday morning and Natalie Wood was discovered Sunday morning 12 days later, uh, dead as a doornail, uh, on November 29th. Yeah, William Holden was discovered on November 17th, and 12 days later, it's Sunday morning, um, November 29th. William Shatner's wife was discovered allegedly at 10 p.m. in his swimming pool in Studio City. Noreen Kidd, and she uh, allegedly hit her head and then drowned in the pool and uh, was considered an alcoholic who took uh, Valium. William Holden was considered an alcoholic and must have hit his head, I guess, on something. His apartment was meticulous. It's well-kept, well-appointed. Anyway, so you should know that uh, the Little Brown Church, where Ronald Reagan and Nancy Davis took their vows of marriage, is walking distance to the Chandler Boulevard address of five houses. I used to think it was three. It's actually five, because there's two pool houses that I neglected to count. You could house uh, 30 people. That's where the Manson family, CBS, casted kids, the girls, the teenagers, they lived near the Little Brown Church that Ronald Reagan got married on uh, March 4th, 1952. And in 1969, which is 17 years later, the Manson family was constructed in close proximity to Cold... This is on Coldwater Canyon. And the, the residences, the five residences with the two swimming pools where Susan Atkins and Patricia Krenwinkel were kept, where, where the Rolling Stones road manager, Phil Kaufman, was the manager of those five houses that kept these girls, along with Harold True, who was a CIA operative with World Vision. And he was the, Harold True's the person that picked up Charlie Manson at Terminal Island Prison on March uh, 27th, 1967. You know, which has been the time that the Maharisha rolled into uh, London to do his transcendental meditation. That was when Charlie Manson's getting out of prison. That's when Timothy Leary uttered those infamous words, tune in, turn on, drop out, in, in around March 1967. So you have Timothy Leary, an LSD guru, psychologist, operating in Haight-Ashbury, San Francisco, as kind of a guru of of uh, tune in, turn on, drop out. 
And I got the Maharishi in London doing the same thing without the LSD using meditation, transcendental style. And you got Patty Boyd and George Harrison being sucked into that, seduced into that operation. All these things are going on simultaneously. And Ronald Reagan, I don't think that's a coincidence that the church that they pick, which by the way, it has extended hours. It's, I don't think it's a 24 hour church, but essentially it goes from eight o'clock in the morning till, till 6 p.m. at night. So you've got a, a wide range that you can pull a service off. And it was an impromptu wedding and, and Ronald Reagan called his friend Bill Holden and he grabbed his wife and they met in Studio Cities on Coldwater uh, Canyon, which again, it's four and a half miles from Frank Zappa. It's about a mile from where the Manson girls were kept, which would make it walking distance to the CBS uh, television studios from the little brown church of San Fernando Valley. I'm not making this up. Ronald Reagan was the screen president of the Screen Actors Guild. As you know, all the Hollywood actors are controlled. Ronald Reagan is the figurehead of the control. We were undergoing wokeism at this time, by the way, people. Just like today, we have wokeism, pronouns, transhumanism. We had that going on when Ronald Reagan and William Holden were at the Little Brown Church. That Back then, it was communist. Are you or you have ever been a member of the Communist Party? That was all going on to weed certain people out of Hollywood, right? Or out of politics. The Joseph McCarthy hearings, they had similar hearings in Hollywood, you know, which was all rumors and innuendo. And Ronald Reagan had a code for the FBI called T-10. Ronald Reagan had a cover name, T-10. He was Agent T-10 for the FBI as an informer. He was a spokesperson for General Electric and he was the president of the Screen Actors Bill Screen Actors Guild, and he was um, undercover agent T10, Ronald Wilson Reagan, which is his real name. And that was going on um, when he was married to Jane Wyman, um, and then shortly thereafter with um, Nancy Davis, who he married on March 4th, 1952. So you should know that Ronald Reagan came from Illinois um, about two hours to the west of Chicago in Tampico, Illinois. And um, William Holden came from a little town near St. Uh, Louis, Missouri, about 17 miles to the east of St. Louis and um, about 180 miles away from where Ronald Reagan was born. William Holden was born. So they both came from Illinois and they both ended up in Hollywood and they ended up meeting each other through Paramount Pictures and Warner Brothers. All right, so something that I didn't expect to find in my research, let me just continue on, that William Holden also won an Academy Award for his 1953 role as an American airman in playing a German prisoner of war in Stalag 17. Bill Holden received Oscar nominations for his part in Sunset Boulevard with Gloria Swanson. And of course, uh, that was in 1950. And in the film Network, one of my favorites with Faye Dunaway and Robert Duvall, remember him from THX 1138 with Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas. And of course, The Godfather, part one and two, Robert Duvall. Network, appearing in debuting in 1976 network with Peter Finch in that film. I always got Peter Finch confused with Albert Finney, who was friends with uh, Brian Epstein and Susan York and uh, Peter O'Toole. I often got Albert Finney confused, but Albert Finney was in the movie with Julia um, Roberts um, the film about uh, PG&E polluting the water. What was that called? That was called uh, Aaron Brockovich. Aaron Brockovich, that was the name of the film that Julia Roberts played the lead role. Aaron Brockovich and Albert Finney was the co-star in that terrific film. 
about corporate uh, malfeasance and cover-up. All right, so I'm going to skip over some of this. William Holden was born William Franklin Beadle Jr. on April 17, 1918 in O'Farrell, Illinois. His father, an industrial chemist, moved the family to Pasadena when William Jr. was three years old. The boy went to school in Monrovia, which is South Pasadena. He attended Pasadena Junior College after graduating from high school. He acted in several radio plays in the junior college. And in 1939, okay, so that's when he's about 20, 20 years old, a talent scout from Paramount Pictures got him a small part in a film called Million Dollar Legs. At that point, it was decided to change his name to Holden, which was the name of a woman who broke the heart of the director. And, and it's a convoluted story. So I guess they felt that Beatle was not, you know, bankable enough. So William Beatle became William Holden in 1939 uh, in debuting, in making his film debut, Million Dollar Legs. Okay. Um, the camera liked his face and his next role was in Golden Boy, which was also made uh, in 1939, and that transformed William Holden into a star. He was handsome, but he looked almost too pretty in that movie, says movie critic Sheila Benson. He had the kind of face that improved over the years. What William Holden came to represent was integrity, the same thing that you got from someone like Henry Fonda. A reassuring presence. Over the years, William Holden's rich but unpretentious voice became a dis as distinctive as in his increasingly craggy face. He always brought a reassuring presence to any scene. There was the sense that his polite, no-nonsense man was capable of heroics if the need arose. Holden made more than 50 movies, including The Wild Bunch, Bridge Over the River Kwai, and Picnic. He also starred in The Blue Knight, which was a television-based movie about a Los Angeles cop. Grover Lewis, a former journalist who is writing a novel about early Hollywood, said that Bill Holden didn't get the recognition that stars like Gary Cooper got, but you look at the movies he made and you realize, especially Sunset Boulevard and The Wild Bunch, those are among the best films ever made. Well, I would also add, Love is a Many Splendored Thing. I w that was made in 1955, starring William Holden and uh, Jennifer Jones, who plays his love interest. And I think that's one of the greatest movies ever made also. That continued William Holden's trajectory. Lewis once interviewed Sam Peckinpah, director of The Wild Bunch, a movie about a bunch of misfits in the West at the beginning of the 20th century who outlived their time. Peckinpah told Lewis of Holden's role in a key scene. Holden and Ernest Borgnine were sitting at, at the campfire passing around a bottle of whiskey and they began talking about their plans to give up their outlaw criminal life. Peckinpah said the whole crew was crying by the time the scene was over. Nobody could have played that role and given it the resonance that William Holden did. It was in The Bridge Over the River Kwai that William Holden most vividly portrayed the American male of the World War II generation. In that movie, he was the perfect foil to Sir Alec Guinness, who played the very correct British Army officer who helped the Japanese build an important bridge in Thailand. And we all learned that the reason that Thailand's important, if you watch my videos, is to get the heroin or opium out of Burma. It's the only reason that you build bridges in Thailand, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying, Burma, Burma. Alec Guinness' character, Chris and Punk Ch Chilius, always went by the book. He knows the Geneva Convention by heart. If his Japanese captors want to build a bridge, then his men will build it. 
Holden, tired and sarcastic, doesn't want to be anyone's hero. Before he escapes from the prison camp, he spends the rest of his time figuring out ways to get out from working for the Japanese. But in the end, he does what has to be done, leading an expedition back to the camp to blow up that bridge. He played a similar hard-bitten character in Stalag 17 that won him an Oscar. His fellow prisoners disliked him, but because he's a hustler looking for a way out for himself, he plays a crucial role in the prison camp escape in the end. Holden actually served during World War II, though he never saw action. Well, I'm going to go on here. He enlisted in the United States Army and was graduated as a first lieutenant in the Army Airborne Officers Candidate School. Yeah, but he worked at Culver City, people, <laughs> doing war propaganda films, just like Ronald Reagan did. That's another thing they had in common. Um, they perhaps were both there at the same time. Ronald Reagan was was uh, enrolled into the uh, Army Reserves, sent to Fort Mason, San Francisco, which is walking distance from the Presidio, you know, where Michael Aquino had a place where Sharon Tate's father was housed, where the Zodiac Lost Killing was housed. Ronald Reagan wasn't at the Presidio, but he was close. He was at Fort Mason, which is close to the Balakutha, and um, near the Marina, in the Marina District of San Francisco, which is close proximity to the Presidio um, part of San Francisco. But in any case, what I'm telling you is Ronald Reagan didn't spend much time in San Francisco. They sent him to Culver City, which is where William Holden was in Culver City. You know, where where Sharon Tate signed her first seven-year contract with MGM in Culver City, where Studio Pictures is now in that building, and where Dorothy Stratton, not her real name, was murdered in close proximity to, to the uh, the film studio in Culver City, where Anne Heche had her mysterious fiery car crash disappearance. Culver City. That's where Ronald Reagan spent his time. That's where William Holden spent his time. Do you understand what I'm telling you now, that it's a small circle um, in studios, in this fraternity, in this perhaps Hollywood cult, that they all marry actresses that are within the cult? They never go outside the cult. All these marriages, for the most part, there's a very few exceptions, but mostly it's actors marrying actresses within the Hollywood industry. And they must be doing that for a specific reason of command and control. Anyway, although William Holden always maintained residences in California, he also had houses in Switzerland and in Kenya. He was a conservationist and worked for years to maintain big game habitats in the African continent. He was not heard much during the 1960s when he spent most of his time in Switzerland and Italy, and he made several undistinguished films. He then made a comeback in 1969 with The Wild Bunch and was praised for his work in Network, you know, with Faye Dunaway and Robert Duvall in 1976. Holden married actress Brenda Marshall, not her real name. He married her in 1941. Okay, we already covered that, that her real name is Ardence Ackerson. They had, they had three sons. This is incorrect. And they and William Holden adopted Artis Ackerson's first husband, who also was an actor, Richard Gaines. He did 75 Hollywood films. Um, they had a daughter, and uh, William Holden adopted Richard Gaines' daughter and became the stepfather to Arden, Ardi, Ardis uh, Ackerson, a.k.a. Brenda Marshall's daughter. They had three sons together, so that makes four. And then William Holden had a out-of-wedlock daughter with a, a, a fling, Ava Mae Hoffman. In 1937, he had a daughter with Ava Mae Hoffman. So that makes five. Three sons and two daughters, one out of wedlock and one adopted. You got that? That's five children for William Holden. All right, so um, Holden and his wife, um, Brenda Marshall, separated in 1963. They were eventually divorced in 1971, I believe. And, uh, okay, so let me get back here on my uh, analysis because there's lots to talk about. 
You should know that in 1966, um, which was during the period where um, William Holden and his wife Brenda Marshall were back together on a vacation in Tuscany in near Florence, Italy, right? Which is a spectacularly beautiful area. It's unclear. I believe they were staying on the ocean at a beach resort, but they rented a Ferrari and they took a drive inland toward Tuscany, which is up the river. And uh, this is an unexplained, bizarre thing that happened. So William Holden is driving this Ferrari sedan, which is uh, has room for four people. And his wife, Brenda Marshall, a.k.a. Um, Artis Ackerman, she's in the passenger seat. They have two 21-year-old sisters, or a 21, 22-year-old sister from New York, and their names are um, Sarah and Susan West. Sarah and Susan West, 21 and 22, are sitting in the back seat. And William Holden is moving along pretty quick in this Ferrari. And he comes across um, an Italian gentleman um, driving a Fiat. And the Italian gentleman, this is important, this is very important. I know it doesn't seem important, but it is. They uh, overtake an Italian salesman by the name of Lino. You know, like Lino LaBianca. Lino Giorgio Novelle. The Lino Giorgio Novelle, who's 42 years old, and I guess he's not in a hurry to get to his next appointment. William Holden overtakes him, hits the horn, you know, waves to him to pull over, uh, Lino does not pull over. Um, it's alleged there could have been some blocking. I mean, William Holden claims that uh, that Lino was deliberately on purpose blocking the road so he couldn't pass. So then William Holden does something that no one should ever do. He attempts to pass um, on the right side of the road. <clears throat> and look, I've been to Italy extensively. I've ridden my bicycle over a thousand miles in Italy. And I'm here to tell you, they don't have shoulders. They don't have shoulders on any roads except the Superstrada. And he's on a county road. He's on a country county road. There's no shoulder. Not in Italy. They don't have shoulders. They have white lines. So this is bizarre that William Holden, don't know if he's drinking. He says he wasn't drinking. He's got his wife in the car. He's got these two 21-year-old little girls in the back seat. Anyway, he attempts to pass on the right. The, uh, he claims that the Fiat pulls to the right, they collide, the Fiat then loses control, goes off the road to the left, killing Lino Giorgio Novelli, dead as a doornail. This is um, on July 2nd, 1966. So there's a trial and a plea agreement deal is reached where William Holden pleads um, guilty to manslaughter, receives an eight month suspended sentence, so no harm, no foul. And it's unclear whether or not he wrote any check to the victim for restitution. There's no information regarding restitution on this case. Essentially, uh, you know, he ran this Fiat off the road. The guy died and uh, no harm, no foul, right? But Lino is dead. Now, the reason I bring that up is who else do we know recently in my last video that had a similar car accident? Doris Duke, you know, who lives next to where Sharon Tate was murdered? <laughs> like 550 feet away from Abigail Folger's body is Doris Duke. You know, the tobacco, Philip Morris Tobacco, American Tobacco Company heiress. Doris Duke. Yeah, around the time that uh, William Holden is going through the Italian legal process about manslaughter in Tuscany, Doris Duke is going through a problem with Eduardo Tyrella, who's a longtime employee of his, of hers. And um, they're in Rhode Island. Um, they're in Newport, Rhode Island, at one of her mega mansions. And they're getting an argument because I think Eduardo Tyrella was a little bit more than a longtime employee. I think he was her lover. And they were in a spat because Eduardo was indicating he's going to go be a set designer in Hollywood and he's going to not see 
you know, Doris as much. He's going to Hollywood for a job. In other words, he's quitting Doris Duke's employment. So they pull up in front of her mega mansion in Newport, Rhode Island, and Ed Eduardo, who's driving this two-ton station wagon, he gets out of the car to unlock the big wrought iron gate. And whilst he does that, um, Doris Duke, who's about 53 years old at the time, she gets out of the car, the passenger side, and gets into the driver's side, guns the motor, and crashes into her employee, Eduardo Ty Tyrella. And then she backs up, reverses direction, and then runs him over a second time. And then she crashes the car across the street to make it look like the car had a stuck throttle or something. Anyway, when police arrive, she just tells him it was an accident and it was just one of those things, right? So that's that. that you know, because it's Doris Duke and she's an important person in Rhode Island and Newport and Hollywood, as we learned, she lives near the, she lives, lives near where Jean Harlow's husband was murder suicided, where Tom Coomer, Jay Sebring lives in that house. That's walking distance from Doris Duke's house. And then, but she's even closer to where Sharon Tate gets whacked, which is a surveillance house. And so she's a big time player in Hollywood. She's a big time player in Hawaii. She's a big time player in Rhode Island, Newport. So, and she has other residences too. Anyway, the way this is, goes down is that the police don't charge her with any manslaughter. So she doesn't have to deal with William Holden's problems, but she does write a check for $75,000 to Eduardo Tyrello's family as a way to apologize for his accidental death. And around that time, she writes a $100,000 check to the Maharisha so that he can make sure that he's going to London in a couple months to lure Patty Boyd and George Harrison into transcendental meditation. This is when Doris Duke finances the Maharisha, which is the summer of love in London. Remember, we had the summer of love in Haight-Ashbury, San Francisco with Timothy Leary and Charlie Manson. But in London, we had the Maharishi and transcendental meditation <laughs> and Doris Duke writing the writing checks. This is this is just in the Bill Holden story. It's like I'm trying to stick to the script, but the thing is, I can't resist the fact that we have these people like Bill Gates, like Jeff Bezos, who's that's not his real name, it's Jorgensen, like uh, Oliver Stone, not his real name, it's Silverstein. We have all these people who are not who they say they are and they're writing checks and they're money laundering in these activities and I just can't help myself. I think it's more than a coincidence that that William Holden's most beloved movie is Love is a Many Splendored Thing, Splendor, and that Natalie Wood is killed on her 55-foot yacht, the Splendor, drowned, thrown into the water at 3 in the morning like a sack of potatoes by Robert Wagner, who's in a television show with Stephanie Powers. Well, guess who William Holden's girlfriend of nine years is when he dies in 1981? Stephanie Powers. How come she didn't find the body? She's working with Robert Wagner, who says he doesn't know how his wife ended up in the water drowned. And he's on the boat with her. And he's the last person to see her alive. And he tells the skipper of the boat, don't turn on the floodlights. And he proceeds to open up a bottle of whiskey instead of looking for his wife, Natalie Wood. Not her real name, Natasha Zakarenko, who dies on the Splendor. And William Holden's apartment is decorated like the set of Hong Kong, Love is a Many Splendored Thing. And I'm going to read you something from this film. It's very poignant. But in this film, you have a married man who's known as Mark Elliott and uh, in the movie Love is a Many Splendored Thing. And he is separated from his wife, travels to Hong Kong to, to uh, cover the Chinese so-called Civil War. He meets a Eurasian medical physician um, played by Jennifer Jones, who plays Dr. Han Suen. They fall in love. They have a romantic, uh, deep, passionate romance. Then um, the Mark Elliott character is called to Korea to cover the Korean War. 
and uh, he goes off to report on that, and he writes letters every day to his beloved mistress, Jennifer Jones, Dr. Han Suen. She moves into with a friend with her adopted daughter from a previous relationship, and she's madly writing love letters back and forth to, um, to the William Holden character. And so these lovebirds are writing letters, and then, um, then the, the film pans to the kitchen where Jennifer Jones's character, the doctor, is serving tea to her daughter, her adopted daughter. And her daughter knocks the teacup off the table and it shatters on the floor of the kitchen. And it's at that exact moment that the camera pans over to Korea where we see Mark Elliott typing a letter to his love interest, Dr. Han Suen, where he's writing that he can't believe he he hasn't run out of ideas to talk to her about in his letters. And at that moment, a um, Korean bomber plane flies over and he ducks for cover, but the bomb explodes in proximity where his typewriter was, killing the Mark Elliott character. And that is the exact moment that the teacup explodes on the floor of the kitchen in Hong Kong. And that's when Dr. Han... Suen senses that her lover has died, been killed. She doesn't have confirmation of that yet. So she goes, there's a difference between the book and the film, but in the film, she senses there's something wrong. So she goes to a place on a grassy hillside above Hong Kong, where she's made love with Mark Elliott. And she hears his voice. But he's not there. And the voice says to her, I often think that healing is man's salvation. And I envy your ability to help. You know, because she's a physician. You deal with suffering, but you can do something about it. I can only stand and watch. Then there's a pause. And the William Holden character says we have not missed you and I many splendid things and that's the end of the film it's really sad and I think it's sad that uh, in real life not in Hollywood that's 1955 but in 1981 that William Holden dies in his apartment that obviously he fell in love with the Jennifer Jones character and the entire decoration and set from Hong Kong. And he decorated his luxury apartment in Santa Monica that way. And somebody whacked him in the forehead and he bled out on the floor. And then 12 days later, Natalie Wood is drowned in Santa Catalina Island. And I, I think that William Holden was murdered. I think someone hit him in the head with a blunt force instrument and Thomas Noguchi called it a accidental death, just like they called the Noreen kid Shatner an accidental death that she hit her forehead and drowned in the swing pool at the studio city home of William Shatner, which I'm calling that a murder. That's not, that's not an accident. And the William Holden, he's 63 years old. Yeah. He drank a lot. But that doesn't look like an accident when you have a divot in your head and the Los Angeles Times to anchor bias through linguistics, through applied linguistics, indicates that the coroner said it was an accidental natural causes death when they admit that no medical examination had been performed. So that's what we're dealing with here with the actor William Holden, who lived a rich life until age 63. Anyway, thanks for listening. Hit the like or subscribe. And we'll talk again soon. Thanks again.